Yeah, I'm doing all right. You know, all things considered, this lockdown and all the shenanigans that go without homeschooling and being stuck on screens, yeah, it's killing me. But yeah, I guess a lot of people have it a lot worse, to be honest. Yeah, I'm going a bit, uh, I just feel a bit brain dead for not doing a lot. But, um, you know, it could be worse, so you say. Yeah, yeah, it's just gone on for too long now, isn't it, really? It's just like, oh, come on, a year. Uh, when was the last time you two saw each other then? I think Pat said you went to. The Pallington's gig a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, we didn't bump into you then, but obviously we saw you. Saw you doing your, yeah. you know, asserting your art, as it were. But no, that was great. Yeah. It's a really nice um, step back in time, really, because I think both Pat and I have, have well, I was going to say been involved with that scene, but that scene stopped being involved with itself quite a while ago. But it was just nice to get back in touch. And it's amazing yeah. how much of the same faces, and it really evokes those same feelings it's really weird it's like it's yeah. like stepping, stepping back to in 10 years and all of the same feelings come back it's really weird actually yeah i know exactly what you mean it's like just seeing the same people i mean i don't i didn't expect anything less to be honest but like it was like yeah just seeing everyone again it was like a, a proper spirit lifter it's kind of what we need right now isn't it i think so yeah and it's like everyone's there but they're all a bit older yeah, yeah. It's, okay. I don't remember you like that, but I can see underneath that the aged face. It's you, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Those people I'm talking about in my eyes, I'm not. But uh, yeah, mm. <laughs> it's kind of what this podcast is all about, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Nostalgia. Where would it be without you? Eh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I suppose that's a good place to start. Really, Adam. Like back in the day when you when the white spot with Pat. Like, can you yeah. give us an idea of like? I ended up getting into music in general. Well, I guess getting into music would be listening to it really initially and developing some kind of sense of identity around the coach, cultural tribal stuff. So, yeah, 15, 16, getting into probably the Manchester stuff, um, you know, watching that, I guess, that classic episode of Top of the Pops with uh, Mondays and Stone Roses and being like a young teen and being blown away by that and thinking, wow, this is really something exciting um so from there getting heavily involved in buying their records and going to see those bands i think i just started to play the drums as well around a bit later than that but where did you grow up i grew up in a place called bletchley in milton Keynes, in sunny milton Keynes. Did you? yeah yeah it was it was all right i mean i guess it's a typical new town really you know uh yeah there wasn't much my family weren't musicians or anything. There wasn't much aspiration. People around you kind of either going factories or, you know, getting involved in misdemeanors. Um, so there was, it was never, music was never right. You know, I can do this as a career. I just started knocking around on the drums because I quite fancied it and then didn't do anything formal with it really until I got to about 19. Um, I went to college and done a BTEC. Um, I was getting a lot of problems where I grew up on my estate, I was getting to a lot of, uh, yeah, just, you know, light crime and drugs. It was really messy. And at that time in your life, or in my life anyway, there just seemed to be no future. It just means, well, what am I going to do? I've been kicked out of school virtually with no qualifications. So there was no career plan. Um, yeah, and it was really struggling, um, really struggling, I guess, emotionally, psychologically, and managed to wangle this sponsorship type initiative from the go from our local council to go out of Milton Keynes and go to Essex to do a BTEC. So I went there and I realized that if I apply myself and I practiced, I could really achieve stuff. And um, yeah, I kind of put two and two together there and thought, well, if I practice lots, I can get quite good at playing. So I've done a lot of practice on piano, guitar and drums. It also helped that I didn't know anyone. It's not like uni where loads of people come in from different towns mm. and all meet you know i went to a college and most of the colleges are just local schools so for the first few months i had nothing else to do anyway i was well out of my comfort zone from all my friends from back home so we just practice we just literally i bought an old keyboard and just started practicing sort myself how to read piano music and then guitar music and done a bit of drum practice whilst doing this b-tech um that's where it kind of started playing wise for me i think 
Oh, that's cool. Like, it's it, it's really good, like hearing that, because you know, coming coming from a place like Milton Keynes, where you're saying there's not a lot going on, it kind of it kind of makes it more inspiring in a way, doesn't it? Like, yeah, you know, well, like when you hear, like for instance, like the Gallagher story and like where they came from and stuff, it's like it gives kids now, or I think, like, or or even whenever. It just, you know, like coming from wherever you come from, you can still make it. Do you know what I mean? I think that's the beauty of it. And I think that's the danger of the now, which I guess we'll talk about a bit later. But for me, it was that it was that sense of hope that anyone can, especially, you know, more so in mm. it's probably electronic music now as well, I guess, to an extent. But anyone can anyone can make it and whatever that is. And for me, I was also in a place where I didn't think I could do anything else. It was only from achieving in music then I've got the confidence to try other things later on in life. But if it wasn't for that, achieving something in music, I would have never had that confidence to, to have even tried anything else because I thought this is all I can do. It was only after mm. doing doing that BTEC and then I didn't think I'd get a degree course, but at that time there was a pop music um, and jazz degree. There's only two in the country. It's not like now where you've got, you know, your BIMs and your BAMs and all these, these kind of pop music courses. So I got in on that. I think I scraped in a few clearing and, that was a three-year degree and I was well out of my comfort zone again. You know, people had been to the Royal Academy and the Guild Hall on weekends and there's me. I, I, I was I had an, a very basic level on guitar, drums and piano and I managed to slide in. And then it was at the end of that, I thought, what am I going to do? So I'd done a teacher training, secondary music teacher training and got onto that. And every single step of the way, I thought, oh, I've managed to sneak in here. No one's quite found me out yet. Um, <laughs> And then it comes to the crunch and they said to me, oh, on your teacher training, we've noticed you haven't got any GCSEs. And uh, and of course, I'm teaching in the school. So I had to go and resit English and maths in this kind of makeshift GCSE English and maths course. Um, but and then, you know, realizing, well, maybe I can do something else and teacher training, done the teaching stuff for a bit, enjoyed that, um, sidestepped into teaching instruments whilst playing in loads of different bands and then during all those different bands, you know, one one got lucky. So was that based in London, the teaching and everything? Yeah, yeah. Well, I went to so I went from Essex doing a BTEC. Then I'd done my degree was in Middlesex, but that's based in North London. So I went to North London, and then three year degree, then a one year post grad because I didn't know what I was going to do teacher training, and then te- taught in some North London schools. So I was kicking around North London, East London area. Um, and then I ended up shifting from school teaching GCSE stuff to just teaching instruments because it gave me more flexibility. And then I ended up doing like a two and a half day week and then spending the rest of my time practicing and playing in bands. And for me, that was that was the perfect balance because I had a good income, you know, in a little basement damp flat. I could practice my five, six hours a day. And in the evenings, I could go out and play in loads of different bands. It was bliss. It was the best, best time I'd had. And DJing as well. You know, at the current time, you know, the DJ gigs. So it was a lovely balance, actually. What was your first band like that you, you felt like you were, you know, you were happy with? or? Um, I guess in Milton Keynes, we'd started a band. I think they were called Cirrus Minor, I think. Um, really, we kind of just, just get wasted and just play for hours. Um, it was just kind of a Pink Floyd self-indulgent thing. But then when I moved, went to college, I think they started taking it more seriously and it done okay in Milton Keynes but that was the first band I played in and that was the first sense of what a band might be you know being that age have all these aspirations and think yeah we, we could make it and we could do something and being stuck in somewhere like Milton Keynes at a time when it was all from Manchester it was really quite I guess it was quite dour you didn't really know where you were going to fit in so we didn't really do any shows mm-hmm. or anything we had a singer but the singer didn't ever want to sing so it was a bit it was an interesting concept. <laughs> That's difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I always thought that was difficult, but you know, I kind of left them and went to college, um, and then they, you know, they, they've done quite a few things in Milton Keynes. So he was a really good friend of mine, actually. His, his name was David, and he took his own life, like mid twenties. Um, you know, through his own demons, as it were. So that was a, that's a big miss. And I think it's always these things that you carry with you in all of the band careers where I tend to remember those things as well alongside all the other band stuff. So regarding Mm. a a band which was, you know, had a big impact initially would have been, would have been them, you know, kicking around with, with all these guys that were in a similar position to me really in the old Kings. There was nothing much going on. 
get together and just, I don't know, try to escape the, the shit life that was around us. So when it came to getting in bands in London then, was it like through people uh, you worked with or through uni or how did you kind of mix with people? Yeah, well, I guess my uni stuff was more jazz people and they were well, you know, well, I consider them superior to my level of playing. Um, I, at the same time as doing a jazz degree, I was really into all that stuff. But I also had like a foot in the indie world and was doing just in different bands. And I think the first, probably the first step I got into that is I was going to a night in East London called Happiness Stands and there were a load of guys there that were into like breaks and stuff um, and they needed a drummer to play onto their backing tracks against their electronic stuff so I joined that band they were called Mains Ignition and they were signed to the label that signed Groove Armada. What year was this? I think this was 99 yeah right. 98, okay. 99 um, so done electronic stuff with them and then from that, they were managed by a guy called James Malord. And then when, I guess it was like the early noughties, suddenly there was this, there was this real lull. So post Britpop, actually I was in a few little Britpop bands as well during Essex, but there was this real lull post Britpop that had died. You know, we had this lovely time of like 94 to 97, all these great bands coming mm. out again. So in, in my man, mind, the big steps were, uh, Manchester, and then I guess we had a bit of shoegaziness, and then we had grunge, and then we had Britpop, which was a glorious time, and then that died a bit, and we had kind of a bit of breakbeat, a bit of more of the serene bands like Travis and Elbow and these kind of bands, and then it pumped back up with White Stripes, Strokes, and those kind of bands coming back over. But before that, mm. there was a lot of electronica in East London, and then I started to see a lot more guitars come through. And just as we'd released this Electronica album with, with Mains Ignition, it wasn't Electronica, but more electronic, kind of guitars come in and, and stole that scene. But because James Malone was managing that band Mains Ignition, I think he got me involved with the White Sport. The White Sport were initially an electro duo of Andrew Avelin and a guy called Magnus. Um, so I joined them as the drummer. And then there was this huge, really exciting time in East London, this transition. Um, and then the white sport got more bandy. At the same time, James had met Pete and he had wanted to get out of the Libertines contract or wanted to kind of just do more solo writing. So he formed this Monica Baby Shambles. Um, so at the time, all this stuff was really exciting. Um, so he had mm. one leg in the Libertine still, just contractual obligations. I think there was a lot of tension there. James took him under his wing. And that was the start, really, of that whole scene. We were in the band called the White Sports Supporting, Patrick and myself. And I think Patrick and Peter had formed, you know, this, this alliance together. And then I just ended up fluidly getting involved with that, really. So it was all part of the, the travelling circus that was moving through. Yeah, I remember Pat saying uh, that you'd play two gigs at the same night with the white spot and baby shambles was that happening at some point yeah i think pete was a bass i think it was our bass. <laughs> i mean we couldn't fit enough people in the car so we were just trying to do cameos so right you can do drums on this yeah so we were supporting probably that would have been like uh 2003 maybe or four supporting baby shambles and as the white sport and i could see them getting bigger and bigger and obviously he'd already got a lot of traction from the libertines anyway so a lot of press were interested and a lot of people were were following his solo moves but i could see the band getting bigger and bigger it was mayhem in those early days you know we weren't i weren't even on stage with him i could see the uh the level of i don't know of, of just frenzy that was was following him really more so so yeah supporting that band and then still playing with patrick a lot we often just played together anyway just him and i just jam um and then yeah then the phone call to say jim is not in the band anymore do you want to join um and, that, and that's where it all began, I guess. Yeah, it was it a bit of a no-brainer at that point then? Uh, I don't know. It was a weird one because I'd started to move in this direction of thinking, OK, I want to do band stuff, but I know that there's not much money in it, so I need to try and pace myself and work out a way where I can continue doing the life I like. So teach two or three days a week whilst doing music. Um, it was never. I was never one of those kind of people that just go, yeah, I'll jump into it and you know, sleep on couches and stuff. I think I knew I had to make ends meet somewhere and I knew that all the bands I was in, none of them were making, there's no money in it. Um, so I always knew I had to be quite 
grown up as it were and sensible and not just throw it all to the wind so I did think about it overnight and I thought god this would be massive and if, if I join because I could see the trajectory they were on um so I just thought if I don't do it I'll always regret it um so I just said yes and then the next day gave all my notice in for everything I was doing teaching jobs I was in a bit of a master's as well just gave all of that notice in and just thought all right let's just go and see see what happens yeah yes and then so what was that 2004 was it uh, 2005 yeah that was like late 2004 and then early 2005 I guess when I formally joined them but that transition was over a couple of months I think from from Gemma leaving and it did get it was a it was a crazy time you know when when I think back to the fights and the arguments and everyone was in a bad way with drugs it didn't to be honest I didn't think it was going to last I thought this isn't going to last but I'll kick myself if I don't do it um so yeah that would have been very late 2004 and then I joined the band January 2005 I guess more formally really right so I mean within I don't know a matter of days or months you'd be playing some pretty major gigs I remember a major like Glastonbury festival slot that summer yeah, or the Brixton one I always remember. And uh, I remember being on stage because, yeah, when Patrick called me, Brixton was the following week. And, um, I mean, I'd done a lot of playing, so, I was, you know, I knew I could cope. But because of the jazz background, I knew I could loosely follow and improvise anyway. But some of those songs are quite complex in terms of the, the shifts. And I remember Pete coming up to me on Brixton and just saying, just follow me. And I'm thinking, what is 7,000 people out there? Um, and then, and then me, so just following him, and lucky enough, him and Pat had a fight, so that gave me a bit of a, a kind of a, <laughs> a few minutes grace to get my shit together. But we didn't even have a drum kit, I think we were using the Cazelle's drum kit. And, um, you know, he's, he's, he's a great drummer, but he plays a real uh distinct way of having his drum set up really low. So I'm on this kit which doesn't feel feels really foreign. I'm trying my best to play songs I don't know, and he's just starting songs that I've never even heard and I'm thinking there's, there's a lot of people out there watching me um so it was a bit of an initiation of fire so when when uh, that fight kicked off it was a bit of a relief really I was like oh thank god that happened <laughs> yeah. that was the beauty of Pete though wasn't it? and not the fighting but um you know just like just so spontaneous I guess yeah, and I like, and like that for me. I mean, people, uh, and the fans loved that as well. Like, there was just something different about it uh, yeah. compared to other bands. Yeah, and that's, that's what's great with it. And I think because I can follow that kind of stuff, I can just, I guess, same with Drew in a way, and same with Pat, we can all kind of half improvise, so we can all just meander around whatever he's doing and, and whatever drugs are flowing. We know it's going to be slower or faster than it was the night previously as well. But that is, I found that really exciting. I think initially having that initiation, which was quite different to other bands, especially playing venues that size. It set me up really. And I thought, okay, well, this is how it's going to be. It's going to be pretty much off the cuff. And uh, I think my own personality as well finds that maybe it's that addictive part that really is drawn to hyper-stimulation. Although it's exhausting, it's also really exciting. Um, there's something I'm drawn to about that as well. Yeah, I imagine when you're you kind of pull it off and it all comes together. It must be a very good feeling. It is. And it's uh, not a very good feeling when it doesn't get to <laughs> yeah. oh, this is the other side of it. I was actually watching a gig yesterday. I think someone only uploaded it this week, but it's when you played uh, the 100 Club from that year. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, it seemed a similar thing. I think maybe you were just getting your head around some of the songs and like <laughs> it all seemed like quite loose at that point. But I guess that was part of the excitement of it, I guess. Yeah, and I think everyone was loose as well. I think, you know, whether that be through drugs, through drink, through just the emotional turmoil that was going around, you know, I mean, he was under under those years. I mean, Pete was part of such pressure. You know, he had these two big bruises, like ex-military people from Rough Trade on his on his back. He was under curfew, he couldn't breathe. He had the press hounding him um, with massive struggle with substance. And it's kind of no wonder that it was such a ramshackle, but it was a very exciting time. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously we talked to Pat about, you know, what it was like being in the band and stuff, but just just trying to get an idea of like the day to day of being in Baby Shop was obviously it's quite unique to any other band. And I saw an interview where you said there's a lot of peaks and troughs and that you actually used to treat every show as if it was your last. Is that kind of your attitude at the time? Yeah, I think so. I think we never knew. I think we never knew whether 
you know, the, the level of, of drugs and stuff that was being knocking about, you never knew. You thought, is this going to continue? Um, people coming in and out of the band, management, labels. There was so much friction and tension. It wasn't like a plain sailing band where you look at your diary and say, OK, well, come November, we'll have a few months off. Then we'll do this. It just wasn't like that. It was day by day living. Um, and you just have to take it like that. I think it calmed down a bit during the late, later years. Um, but in that initial period, it was literally like it was either going to implode or explode. Um, that's how I've, I've sensed it anyway. So for me, it was just like, well, climb aboard and just hold tight and see where it takes you. Yeah, I mean, some of you around at that time, was that kind of part of all the excitement? Like you didn't know what was going to be around the corner kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, um, obviously for us as a band, it was different. But yeah, touring, like the excitement around that for us. I mean, we we were fans, obviously, as well. Like we, when we started off as a band, we were just, we were fans of the Libertines and, and what have you. But, um, you know, at the start of the Shambles as well, I think before you were introduced into the band as well, wasn't it, Adam? Um, you know, every if we were invited on any tour or whatever, it was like, yeah, you just, you never knew what was going to happen. And it, that was, the, that was one of the, and we, we were just buzzing to be supporting anyway, because it was just like, you couldn't be in a better position as a, as a support band, I don't think at the time, because it was just so exciting. And like, like you say, you just never know, you never knew what was going to happen. I mean, you didn't even know if the show was going to happen some night. <laughs> exactly. And then, and then you didn't know whether you were going to end up on, on, what bus you were going to end up on or whether you were going to end up in a in a riot band or something yeah that's something that's kind of how it was and <laughs> and it i mean it was fun like not that it's cool to get arrested or anything and like do drugs but it, it was fun at the time and like it's what we it was part of the dream i guess in in, in the back of our heads when we were when we were growing up yeah and i mean we talked to pat about you know, the fact when you are having to cancel gigs and everything and you guys are kind of left there with your drumsticks in your hands. <laughs> yeah, what was that yeah. feeling like? Was that, did you ever have points where you thought, yeah, I can't do this anymore? Or you thought you might have to do something else? It's horrible. I think the most, you know, the demanding time is when it normally be Drew and I left there and it, you can almost cry because of the atmosphere. There were so many sad people there and there was so many, you know, they're waiting to see their, their idol as it were. Um, I mean, we never got blamed for it. You know, people never accused us because they could see we were there in that sense. But yeah, there was that disappointment. And I think after so many of them, what tends to happen is you start to, uh, I guess, edit your own excitement because you don't know whether it's going to happen or not. You tend to not get that, not as excited as you did because you think, well, I don't want to get too excited in case it doesn't happen. So during the periods when it was really turbulent, it was it was difficult because... There was the excitement you never knew it was going to happen but when it got bigger and you knew you were kind of letting people down it, it weren't so much that rebellious nature anymore do you know what i mean it's a bit like god people have kind of bought hotels and stuff like that and I, there was that element of like i don't think this is very fair anymore um but on the side of it i think you know he was doing what he was doing and when you're in deep in those places how many of us really think about the other in that sense was there ever a time where you'd have to like have a word with him or you try and change? I mean, it wasn't just Pete, I guess. Pat said, you yeah. know, he had a problem as well. I mean, yeah. did you try and talk to him or how did it work? Not really. No, I, I knew I kind of, you know, I knew my place in that band effectively. It's like I, I can and everyone will be full of apologies and we'll never do it again. But it kind of falls on a deaf ears, really. And there was a bit of just acceptance of this is this is what it is um, and a, a bit of resignation in that sense as well. It's a bit like, okay, well, I do have a choice here. I don't have to be in this who I don't want to be. Um, and I'm choosing to be. And I can certainly try to put things in place, um, you know, making sure people can maybe go and pick him up. When when James Malone wasn't around any longer, because that was James's job. James would literally spend the night with him to get him on the bus. And I remember being like, on the start of every tour, tour bus would be parked up outside his house for an hour two hours, four hours, eight hours, sometimes for 24 hours, we'd just be stuck on this bus waiting. Um, and then the bus would go without him and he'd say, oh, he'd catch us up. And then he'd say, oh yeah, I'm just popping to Paris. And just like, no, you've got a show in an hour. 
um so it was those kind of things it was just when i think back it it was mayhem really it was real mayhem but there was a a sense of after that happens goes on for a few years there's a bit of resignation it's just a bit like okay well let's not get too excited in case it doesn't happen yeah i mean pat told us about the time the oasis gig where apparently liam ended up booting your gear or something because he was so frustrated (laughs) Yeah, well, that was, my oh, nice. that was my chance to shine. Uh, of course it was, Emily yeah, Keynes, yeah. You know, it's Milton Keynes Bowl. This is like, this is Freddie Mercury, REM, like big players. And there I would have been, you know, my homecoming. Um, and I remember being on this little minibus and getting later and later. Um, and then suddenly you hear that he's, you know, he's with Kate somewhere and she can't wake him up. And then you hear kind of Liam or, or Noel on the phone sound and that's it, fuck you. We're never going to play with you again. We're not going to. Because, you know, they were really, they were, they were kind of, at one point, Noel was offering us the mantle of rock and roll. And that would have been a huge, big deal. And I think we would have sidestepped more into that fan base as well. Um, mm. Because we were always on the periphery, I think, because of the nature of the drugs and the politics. That kind of Britpop fan base were always a bit reluctant to, to get involved. And unfortunately, yeah, it's like a bit of a killer. Maybe we'll uh, make it up sometime down the line. But I really wanted that gig. Uh, I would have loved it. That would have been my homecoming, but it didn't happen. You mentioned Kate Moss and everything. And when it comes to Pat leaving, he said he left because of the whole circus that was going on, which I didn't really delve too much into. But... um, like, what was what were your thoughts at that time when he left? Could you understand understand why he left? I didn't really understand why he left, whether it was like a... Because even, you know, when I relate that to my... When I left, stroke got kicked out. It just ends up in such turmoil that you're not sure whether you've been kicked out or you've left. Um, and I think those two were quite close, and I don't really know what went on. I think maybe... I don't, I don't know whether it was the whole kind of Kate Moss thing that got in the way... Um, but I can relate to it on that level and I can see how it did just get more and more crazy. I know Pat was going, you know, down further into a deep hole. Um, I'm sure he's, you know, he's told you about his own stories, but as, as one of my best friends, you know, there came a point where I was no longer going to go and get him out and, you know, get his guitars back and work out all that stuff for him. Um, and it became progressively more difficult. I think as a bit more kind of money came in, obviously that money goes to other places where it's going to self-destruct. And that was what was happening. It felt like it's going to implode. We kind of did. I think the implosion of that band happened in 2006 before the Blinding EP. You know, Pat was no longer in the band. Pete had gone to rehab and then been kicked out of rehab. He's wandered around Arizona desert somewhere. It's just like, okay, this is, this is over now. Um, and I honestly thought it was. I thought the whole thing had collapsed, but it was a great, good, fun year. And I was just thinking about, okay, what can I do now? I can do a bit more teaching, you know, try and join some other bands. But I thought it was over, really, at that point. Was that the same year as the Arena documentary, I think, I was watching? And it's interesting watching your interviews and that because you almost took on more of a manager-type role or you kind of helping management organise things. Is that kind of the role you fell into a little bit? Yeah, so for probably after that period, I thought, well, if someone doesn't grab the reins on this, the whole thing's going to collapse. Um, so, you know, even maybe from a selfish perspective, trying to keep it together. Yeah, I'd call around, like, you know, call around to Kate, to Kate's PA, see where Peter was, get him out, just trying to just generate some form of motion within the band. Um, and at that point, we'd been booked into... Yeah, rough trade. I was trying to organise getting re-signed to them just so there was some element of motivation because there was nothing. We were free-floating. Rough trade didn't want to sign the band. They didn't want to sign Peter Solo, um, which actually left a bit of a sour taste in my mouth since though I was running around like a headless chicken getting them all of their press campaigns sorted out. But, you know, end of the day, money talks and it's a business, isn't it? But so there was that. And then we'd been one saving grace is we'd been booked to play a festival in 2006, Get Loaded Festival. And just as they'd started to roll the press out, I think it must have been March, April, they're trying to sell this festival on the back of us because we're headlining. And his, he got, Peter got arrested and put away and they didn't know whether they were going to bail him. And this guy that was running the festival, he also owned, owned Turnmill Studios in East London, uh, Farringdon. 
So I think Peter was in and out of rehabs and stuff. And he said to us, look, to generate some more good press and interest, why don't you just come and use the studio? So we did. So we went there and kind of decamped to that studio and just plotted up there for a few months um, and just put some demos together, which was a blinding EP. And then from that EP, managed to get a deal with Parlophone Records and they signed then two albums and that EP. So we were really lucky at that point. But this was before the old industry collapsed as well. Was this was this when Drew stepped in? A, was it you and Drew who stepped in a bit with the writing? Or was yeah, that a bit yeah. later on? Well, we'd done a bit of that. I think we we definitely had more space to do some of that stuff. Yeah, so the blinding EP, we'd all kind of contributed towards. Um, yeah. So we were doing all that and we just try to instigate any sense of any movement, some traction, because the whole thing was the press weren't interested. It was kind of written off, I think, at that point. Um, and then this this Get Loaded Festival really saved it. And this guy called Danny Newman put us in turn mills to do the blinding EP. And that was pretty shoddily recorded but uh the mix of Chenzo Townsend re you know I think he done a great job of, of mixing it um remiking it all that kind of stuff with different rooms and it made it sound great and it really reignited all of us and the Parlophone deal helped and off we were back again quickly going back to you know you kind of in the management side of things you said it was a lot to do with who Pete trusted as well and we didn't really ask Pat too much about that but I mean was there a sense that there were a lot of people around trying to get the most out of the situation if you like like take advantage were you aware of that at the time? Yeah I think you know there was a level of trust between us at that point we've been through a lot together um, I think in, in the nature of any business there's going to be you know he was probably a very lucrative person to know and he's also a very charitable person he's very giving as well um, you know sometimes too giving and I think people take advantage of that as well. So I think there was this reluctance to trust lots of people. And most of the time you trust these people and then they do turn out to kind of squeeze you a bit dry, especially in the music industry. It's, it's, it's renowned for that level of play field. But yeah, I, I think that trust thing, yeah, that helps. I think because there was, there was that level of trust we'd all come through and there were people on the periphery trying to get access to, to him more so. Um, that helped to kind of re reclose it down into a small community with just us. Just looking back at documentary, I wanted to ask you this question because uh, I was watching who the fuck is Pete Doherty and uh, <laughs> everyone seems to be in like normal places getting interviewed yeah, yeah. and then you're in like an act on a pole. active strip club in the background yeah, yeah. with you. Yeah. Well, a guy called um, <laughs> Roger Pottery, I think. Was that his name? Yeah. yeah, I think he's no longer with us, sadly, but... He suggested it to me. He said, do you want to meet in Soho and you can do your interview? I went, yeah, okay. He said, meet me here. And it was right next door to Jazz After Dark. So I thought, okay, Jazz After Dark. And I got to Jazz After Dark and I realised it was the door before. <laughs> and there he was. I went, well, okay. So I just went with it. It's kind of like, <laughs> I don't, didn't really know. I just, you know, you do what you're told. And it's, all right, cool. Um, but in hindsight, yeah, maybe it wasn't the best of choices as I get a bit older. <laughs> no, I'd love to say I listened to what you were saying, but I was a bit distracted. Yeah, yeah, me too. Don't know what. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I wanted to ask you about your memories of the NME Awards in 2006. And I mean, obviously, for an experienced musician like you, it might not have been a big deal, but I noticed you had the strokes that right in front of you when you're playing Albion, I think. Right. Just wondered what events like that were for a band like Baby Sham was and whether, you know, you would get nervous or you weren't really bothered about things like that. Was that the one where we stood up? I can't remember. Was that the one where it's we... a bit like half acoustic kind of? Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't even know what I was doing. Um, I think we we come off the back of a tour, and I think we'd all been up for a long time. So to be honest, it would have just blurred into this. All right, you've got to be here. You've got to do this song, and you've got to move on. I, I think I've seen a photo of myself scarfed, and I think I was just on a bit of another planet. To be honest, um, I don't really remember much. I think those tours, the further you get into them the more it becomes surreal. Um, and I think that was in the middle of the tour. And I don't really remember other people being there. Um, don't really even remember being there myself, to be honest. But I've seen some photos, so I know I was there. Um, so unfortunately, I, I can't really tell you what that was like. No, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I suppose I have thought about that. Like, I've not obviously not been in a touring band, but your whole lifestyle has become pretty odd or surreal, like you say. Obviously, you've, you've experienced that as well, Tom. 
Yeah, I mean, I was thinking earlier on, like, when we even first met Adam, like, I honestly, I can't remember. And, and like, like you were saying, every, everything just blends into one and you do feel like you're on another planet sometimes yeah. because you are in a completely different world to everyone else. And, and unless you're in, in it, I guess you don't know what it's like. And you are just getting ushered from from venue to venue or, like, you know, all these parties or, like, award shows and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's that's just the way it is, isn't it? Just, it's too fast, isn't it? It's just too fast because I have, yeah. I have memories of parties and I think, did that party happen? Yeah, I, I wish I could go back and just, like, try and... I wish I... I actually wish I'd, like, documented it more than, than we did because... It's just some of the shit that went that happened, and like some of the laughs, and like the the good memories and the weird memories. Like, I wish I wish I could watch them back sometimes now because yeah, it's just madness most of the time, isn't it? Yeah, it's just too fast, I think, for the normal brain to be able to even comprehend. You know, if if you have mm. exciting stuff happen to you, you might go and have a week on a bend or whatever, but then you you kind of come back and touch base, and your brain can download it all, but. There were times when, like I say, now I'll have a dream. I thought, was did that happen, that party? Or was that a pure fabrication? Um, mm. It was just too fast. And it wasn't just it was too fast. that Even on the days off, you know, there was a flurry of phone calls of, because I think Peter was so in demand coming through me. Can he do this? Can, can he get hold of him? If he does this, he can do that. And it's like, whoa. Just you know, really exciting, but really traumatising on the other side of it. I think I'm still recovering now. <laughs> yeah, I suppose there's not really a lot of time to think or take it in when you're going through all that. No, no, and it was very fast. You know, then not only was it fast, there's all sorts of substances flying around, so you're kind of not in your your uh, what I call your prefrontal cortex <laughs> anyway. You know, you're another planet. Another thing I wanted to ask you about again, you might not have much memory of it. It's just that uh, infamous Pop World interview. <laughs> um, was that just off the cuff like just Pete decided he wasn't interested or what What was the uh, what was the thinking behind that it was a weird one because like, I think none of us were interested and I think because of the whole vibe of the band not being interested someone like that gets really disarmed you know I think there's always a weak link in a band where someone will feel a bit uncomfortable for not giving the interviewer what they want but we were just all like nonchalant oh, yeah I can't be bothered with you um so bless him, you know, he worked quite hard. Um, but it is one of those classic interviews. And I, I certainly didn't have anything of interest that I wanted to say. Or Are we, talk, are we talking about Amstel? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was on the Fuck Forever video, wasn't it, With the um, in the farm? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've just got our hands in our pockets. I think also it'd been a late night as well. Um, so we were, you know, probably hanging. And it's like, you, we've been all, out all night, I think. Um, and then we had all ended up in Brick Lane, and this is where they filmed the Fuck Forever video. I remember just being so spaced out and tired and groggy and calm down, and that horrible mixture. And then there's someone, yeah. who, you know, really enthusiastic, and it's like, oh, I really can't be bothered. Yeah, there's literally no intentions of trying to be rude, but you're just literally done in. So <laughs> yeah. you can't help it. <laughs> And just trying to understand what he's saying. It's like, you know what? I don't have enough brain power <laughs> left to even understand your words, let alone give you any of mine. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, you'd not even listen to the song, so. Yeah. It's quite funny, that. <laughs> um, was that a Hackney Farm or something? Yeah, that was just um, behind Brick Lane. Yeah, ah, still okay. there now. So then we got, we've got the donkey involved and all sorts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, yeah, like, I guess moving on to the second album. And like you say, you're getting, you know, you're back on a like a more secure record deal. Did things start to get a bit more professional? Because I remember coming to see you at that point at like an arena. I think it's Nottingham Arena. Yeah. Did the gig start to become a bit more, a yeah, bit, uh, bigger and slicker kind of thing? I think so. Yeah, I think I think there was two things there. The band had become much more pro. I think Stephen Street had really helped us cement everything together. I think we needed to. I think it would have fallen apart without someone kind of putting a hand in and saying. I think you can do better. And then the label signing you for that much money are going to want you to deliver the goods. You know, Rough Trade can take a few kind of no-shows and studio misdemeanors, but I think they wanted more. Um, so I definitely felt that we could step up and give it more polish than we did. Um, 
but yeah, I think it was much more professional. But with that, there was a bit of boredom with it. I just felt we'd lost something. I felt maybe as a band, those kind of places, it's great to play for my own ego and do the arenas, but I definitely felt really disconnected and a bit sterilised. Um, yeah, there was something about that. You know, you drive in, you drive under, you don't really see anyone, you don't really see the crowd. I don't know, I felt a bit lonely during those times, to be honest. Back. Yeah, like the, the, the whole part of, of that band and, and, and most of the bands around that time and in, in that scene, the whole like the half of it was like the interaction with the fans and the relationship was just like you know when it changes into all the big stuff it just you don't know it doesn't get boring it's obviously like it's that's the dream still it's like to be playing in front of more people and whatever but yeah you just you, it does lose something doesn't it when you play the bigger shows yeah i thought that i thought you know you're so far back um from from the audience, I definitely felt more disconnected from from the audience there. Um, yeah, you know, even money wise, those things don't don't pay as much as some of the, the smaller gigs. Um, mm. But I think there was a plan from the management that are taking over, who were a bit more corporate, that wanted to plan a real career path. And at the time, it felt like a good idea. It's only in hindsight and I look back now, and I, you know, when we were just talking about those days of the one hundred club and going up and down, the M one, the M six. There was something really invigorating about that. And by the time we'd got to like 2007, eight, it's like, I don't know. There was just something a bit a bit stationary about it. It didn't have that drive anymore. It didn't have that real energy and that vigour. Yeah, I guess the whole scene was maybe, I don't yeah. know. What, it was some, just, it, it, losing yeah. its edge a little bit. It was, but it's like any sort of Brit pop as well, isn't it? If you look at these, same as Manchester stuff, I think you have two, three golden years and then everyone jumps on it, saturates it. And then that implodes it. Um, and then you're left with a few scattering ones which make it through that, um, which is the nature of any scene. You know, a label will see it and they think, OK, let's jump on this and make it do as much as we can with it. And it was weird how the guitar scene just died after that. And it hasn't really regained, I don't think. I think maybe. Yeah, I agree. Real. But I sense that. I sense that we were on the dying edge. And then, you know, as my involvement with the band kind of come to an end 2010, 11 time, it was the scene was changing you know it really was the the kind of the guitar stuff was was going down um and it still hasn't really recovered i don't think and maybe it never will because of a, the diversity now and obviously you know much more i guess led by technology um yeah you know different stuff grime was coming in which is huge now it's just so easy to make music from your bedroom like it's uh the world's completely different in every sense in it so like yeah like you say, you never. It's it's, it's sad though, isn't it? Because like, yeah, yeah, I see. The revive, like when things come back round again. Because I have always been like, oh yeah, that this guitar music's going to be cool again too, and and whatever. And it, it just hasn't happened. No, and I'm waiting. And and for me, you know, I guess thinking back to guitar music of you know late or even that you know even late eighties before baggy, so indie stuff. You know, you're talking about bands like the Smiths and and Jangle Pop. That was still guitar music that then merged into baggy and all that baggy was dance based it was still band based and then we had the little dive and then we come back up with grunge and Britpop and the little dive and it come back up with i guess the naughty stuff and for me now it's been going on too long it's like this has got to happen but i'm now i'm not sure you know i'm really not sure i, I hope i'm wrong i hope i'm just cynical but i would love nothing more than that stuff to come back and it, it must do at some point because People must be getting bored now with this kind of R and B tinge grunge kind of not grunge grime like you know rapping on everything and it's just everything mm. just seems a bit sedate. Everything there's there's nothing really I don't know nothing in your face and angry as such that I can hear from maybe my own genre that I'm interested in. Yeah, I think I saw you maybe posted about um, someone's take on the age of streaming and maybe how unfair it is in terms of the pay through. Is that something? you kind of feel maybe is hampering people starting out in music? Uh, yeah, massively. I think what you're going to do, because venues are shutting, um, you know, all these things are kind of difficult to go out and do, was uh, uh, even in the, the naughty stuff, there were a lot of little venues. You know, you could go and tour, you could go up north, you could go to Scotland, you could go to London. But, oh God, especially now during COVID, but I had this lovely thought the other day that if all these offices that no longer want their premises and stuff move out of London... The prices are going to drop, which means things that don't earn so much money and aren't so safe, like 
little gritty venues can hopefully move back in. Maybe there'll be a whole new post-COVID scene. Who knows? But yeah, I think it's hard. I think for, for young bands now, it's so difficult. You know, you've got to do social media stuff and, and all of this. And sometimes that really goes against the, the ethics and the ethos of your band. You're having to post so much content all the time. It's really hard. I don't know if I would have done it now. I think if the environment was like this when I was just starting out, I'm not sure I would have been as drawn to it, to be honest. I mean, we, that's a question we do ask people is if uh, they were starting out now, like how they anticipate it would be different. And I guess that's what you're saying. You don't know if you would have been as excited by everything. Yeah, it wouldn't have felt like it would maybe would have been achievable. Um, was you know, I was growing up around the bands that had come from almost nothing and, and, and made a success of it. There's not that many anymore that I know of. I think there's a lot of small operating ones, but it's not the same. You know, and you've got to do whatever, two, three hours social media, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And the environment, you know, you look at even the charts and stuff. I don't know anything in the charts. I kind of catch up with them every now and then, especially when I was DJing more contemporary stuff. And I don't really like it. I don't really, doesn't move me. There's no names I know. And it's never been for me as stark as it is now in that sense. Um, but again, maybe that's, you know, a testament to my age and the kind of music I'm into. I mean, Pat mentioned that he wished he'd recorded more. Is that something you realised you had to start producing more albums and obviously had the record deal as well? Um, he said, what did he say? He said he wished he'd done more recording. He said he enjoyed recording. He wished he'd recorded more with the band, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was there was so much material as well floating about. Um, it's why Down the Album was so big in that sense. But, um, yeah, I, I think I, I wish we had have done less of the touring of Shot as Nation after a year or two maximum and then you know, got back in the studio, but I guess the allure of playing bigger festivals and, and money was um, detrimental in that way. Because I think sometimes you can only play the same songs for so long. Then you're just treading water, really. Um, it's that balance, isn't it? It's the balance between being creative and, and I guess, earning a living. At what point were you starting another band? Is it Rose's King's Castles? Well, was that alongside me. Baby Shambles? Yeah, and that's just me. I just, I was, I was writing of songs and some of them were a bit twee and melodic, so I thought they're not going to work. So I just done a MySpace, the classic MySpace thing in about 2007. I remember writing stuff in my hotel rooms during the arena tours because I think I was missing that creative element. I think there was nothing happening creativity wise. Um, so I just started writing that stuff and put it under that moniker. Um, then the first album, I played it all myself, played all the instruments, recorded it um, and went out and just I only done solo gigs at that point. Yeah. And were you playing guitar and singing those songs? Yeah, yeah. I kind of just, I, I, I could play basic guitar. But again, it was a bit of an initiation of fire, really. And there was nothing happening in the band. So I just started going out and doing these little solo things. Um, yeah, it was quite, quite a nice, exciting time, really. Yeah, was that quite like a, a nice release, kind of on the side of Baby Shambles? Yeah, because I'd go out when things were paused. So if they were touring, I'd come back and I'd do a few solo shows or DJ shows and then go back out and tour. So it was quite a nice creative outlet to get stuff moving and having a bit of autonomy and agency as well, because something like Baby Shambles, sometimes you're, you're, you know, your, your hands are tied. There's only, only so much you can do. Um, so it's nice to be able to go out and just write some stuff and throw it out there on MySpace, which is a good thing about technology. You know, you can get it straight out there um, back in the days of the MySpace generation. And you touched on it earlier, but were you getting more involved with the, right inside the baby shop yeah yeah i started to do um yeah do a lot more writing um do writing with peter and stuff but i think with him you have to really have knuckled down for a good two three four day sitting <laughs> to get those rights with him um and i don't think i had that stamina ever i think you had to be kind of floating on a similar stream to go down that path so it wasn't that easy but there's yeah, some co-writes that were in shot nation and stuff yeah i think that's what pat said is yeah, they'd end up just sitting in a living room for a few days, hammering songs out. Yeah, and hammering other stuff out as well. But you know, <laughs> it could get quite dark. And for me, it's like, yeah, you know, I guess I've indulged and and my my hope my own mild contextually struggles, but that's another level. Coming to the time where you left the band, Adam, like I saw you said it's very difficult to go into detail at the time. So I don't expect you to now, but yeah, how would you reflect on that time? Can you tell us a bit about what happened? 
oh, it was really horrible. I think it was a real sterile time in the band anyway. I think at this point, we just recorded Peter's solo album and we were waged as musicians. So already you have a massive big power shift. And I think the management obviously knew that it was probably easier and more lucrative. So there's already, you know, cracks in, in the foundation, really. There was a lot of, you know, infighting and it got to the point where I just went to, we were going to go on tour at some point and Drew and I were told we don't want to, you know, we don't want to be in a band with you anymore. Generally, when that happens, I go, yeah, OK, it bumbled along. And a few days later, everything's forgotten. And at this point, something just switched. And I just thought, all right, cool. Well, that's that then. And it was like a real weird, maybe it was just my body taking over and saying, you've had enough. Um, and that was that. It was pretty, you know, it was, I was all over the place anyway. I was really sad. I was really quite jubilant that I was no longer in it. There's a real mixture of emotions. Um, but as I look back now, I think it was probably the best thing I could have done, really. Uh, I did, I did, yeah, I didn't walk away. I was kind of pushed. It was, I think, in a similar vein with Pat, it's like, well, were we kicked out or did we leave? Or was it a case that we were kicked out as we were often kicked out, but we just lost the, uh, we just couldn't be bothered and weren't motivated to kind of get back in, if that makes sense. It was so... It was such a murky, messy well between who was in the band. You know, one minute the general is going to be the new bass player. The next minute some guys meeting East London is going to be the manager. The whole thing was always in disarray. So you just took those things in your stride. One minute, you know, one arm Bob from Glasgow is going to be the drummer. And you're like, OK, right, cool. <laughs> and, but, you know, they, they would maybe do a gig or something and then it would come back to the core band. And you just flexed with it. But at this point, I was like, no, I just had a child. And it's like, you know what? I can't can't do this. I, mean, I can't drive backwards and forwards, picking people up, making sure you're there for a gig. So I think something inside me just clicked. And I was like, all right, cool. See you. And that was that. So who's telling you this? Is it Peter that's often saying, yeah, well, you're not in the band anymore? Yeah. Yeah. That's, all right. Very <laughs> odd. Well, I so think it's just it was just that's indicative of, of the psychological state of everyone was in it was just such a blurry mess i think when it got to that point as well like there was just so many people like coming in and out of like this group and you didn't really know who any of them were because you know there, because of like the intoxication of everything as well it was like there was a lot of hangers hangers on in that sense as well weren't there like yeah people trying to make people trying to make money out of him probably through drugs as well do you know what i mean yeah, it was a mess. Uh, yeah. And, that and he, part... literally, he literally didn't, he didn't, I remember just be like showing up to certain things and you, you know, usually you'd, you'd know like everyone who was part of the crew or whatever, but then they'd be like this random people like coming in and out. And yeah. It would just be weird friendships. And that was it. And I remember one particular time, I think you lot had come up for a party in where he was in Marlborough. And I think for me, that was like, that was like the party's over. You know, there was some celebrations on birthday or something. There was a lot of old people there. Now, by old people, I mean like old, old um, band mates that we'd all friends be friends with, and old yeah. faces. And then there was this new scene happening. And for me, I was at that party, and I remember you little being there, and I remember some other kind of, I guess, of our peers being there. And then this whole crew of new, and I just thought, you know what, this just feels wrong now. It just feels like it's about yeah. to explode and. It was dark, and it's, at that point, it's only a few weeks after that, I think, where the whole thing kicked off. And yeah, I just felt it. I think everyone felt it as well. This is it now. It's got as far as it can go. I mean, you mentioned obviously, but did you feel part of a unique scene back in the day, like when uh, when you're first in the baby sham was, or even white spot? Yeah, I could sense it was there was something really exciting happening, but the more I became involved with it, the more I didn't realise how special it was until after it was stopped, really, to be honest. But yeah, initially, when I was on the outside of it, it felt very special, very raw, very fast and very energetic. Yeah, and was there a, like, is there a high point you can think about? Uh, I think definitely the high point for me would have been within the first year, year and a half, two years. Um, the high points would have been those first exciting gigs, you know, touring the world when we were a ramshackle unit, when the police weren't so much on our back and the media, I guess the media was hot, but it wasn't as sinister as it got. Um, yeah, doing things for the first time, you know, when you kind of fly over to Ibiza and do the big clubs first time and do the big festivals. 
um, that's massive as well. And then after a few, two or three times, it's a bit like, oh, this has got the V Festival's got great lamb chops in their catering, um, <laughs> stuff like that. And you just take it a bit more in your stride. Um, so yeah, the first year, I'd say, all that first year. And is there anything you do differently about any of your time in music, really? Um, I mean, regarding that band, yeah, I'm not sure I would have maybe tolerated as much as I did in hindsight. Um, yeah, I think there's not there's not much more I could have done. Um, I guess there's, there's certain people that I maybe facilitated into the fold um, that in hindsight I wouldn't have trusted so much. But yeah, other than that, yeah it is what it is and I don't really have any regrets as I look back now with more time I do think that I got out at the right time I don't know what kind of a record I'd be if I would have stayed in as it really started to sink Drew must have quite a lot of resilience like it's gone straight from that to being in Liam Gallagher's band doesn't he? Well it's, it's pretty contained now you know I think maybe in the wilder days but I think now it's a pretty slick unit now um, but I guess both Drew and I are quite dissociative which means we're quite good at just cutting stuff off and getting on with it which unfortunately comes back and bites you. But at the time, you better just kind of cut off and just kind of try and find some inner calm or peace and distance yourself from the chaos. And I guess I didn't mention kind of the Libertines aspect, like you left where around the time they were getting back together. Was that kind of always looming over the baby shambles a little bit or is it not something you gave too much no, thought to? Really, I think he was. there was a lot of kind of contempt. I think there was a lot of anger towards what had gone on in the Libertines. Um, yeah, I mean, it didn't, didn't really ever come up, maybe towards the latter part. I think as our band started to not be able to sell out some of those bigger venues, you know, the um, I guess they were Carling Academies back then. You know, we started to struggle to sell out your Sheffields and your places like that. You could see that the demise of the band was was going um, and we weren't recording new stuff. So I thought it was only a matter of time, really. Um, and from that, I guess the Libertine was, was, was quite a lucrative offer because, uh, you know, a chance to re- rekindle that fan base. And in all fairness to them, they'd, they'd done all the groundwork before Baby Shambles. You know, they'd set us up nicely, really. They'd teed, teed us up nicely. Um, but I don't, you know, I'm good friends with Gary. Um, and I remember even on the first Baby Shambles sessions, uh, doing some drumming on them and Gary would come in, I'd, he'd do a bit, I'd then do a bit. But he's just one of those guys that is, is so friendly and a wholesome, good guy. Um, that you can never say anything bad about him. But regarding the rest, I don't know. I've never met real Carl, Carl really. Um, and I've not really ever met John either. Yeah, is, there a bit, is it a bit like football with the goalkeeper's union? Is there a bit of a drummer's union as well? Um, I think probably anyone that meets Gary is like that with him. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like I could say, he's one of those rare people that I don't think he's got any enemies. Um, yeah. You know, he's just such a, a, such a solid, wholesome person. Um I think it'd be difficult to not, not like him. I don't know. I think people just really respect him for that. I think he's very level-headed. I mean, there's no bullshit, but with it, it's just really grounded. So we've always got on, and we've done this drum DJ thing as well after that um, together, this London Guns thing before the Libertines got back together. And we were doing like live drumming and DJing together, um, which was going all right, but we we're just trying to work out how to do it, you know, touring Europe and stuff with that. Um, and then Libertines got big, so off he went. So that, that was that, really. And you obviously, we've mentioned briefly Oasis, but we always try and get a, a Gallagher story out of people, just in case yeah. I've got a funny one to tell. Uh, I don't suppose then, you have. I did have, and I've forgotten it. And I know Noel was there backstage at Brixton Academy, and I think, I, I may well be fantasising this and making it up, but I think he said, you guys smashed it tonight, and I'm going to hand, hand the rock and roll mantle over to you. And in my mind, he gave it to me. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not claiming that or anything, but, you know, as, as a member of the band, um, this could well have been a dream um, as a caveat to that. But I think there was definitely something like that that went on, which was quite a nice thing, you know, because I think he's most, I guess, people that are into the indie stuff, it's, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's up there with, with the best, really. Yeah, he always had like a nice word to say about Baby Shambles or, or Pete's music, didn't he? But just a bit the opposite with Liam, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and I've not really met Liam, to be honest. Um, I've always preferred Noel solo stuff anyway, I think. I think he just doesn't stick to formula. Um, and, you know, he writes them himself, and there's no harm in getting songwriters, but I think I always have a bit more respect if you do. And if you think, well, maybe this won't, you know, get to top 40, but it's what I'm writing, and that's that. 
I guess it's different between being a commercial artist and a creative artist in that sense. Moving on to your like current stuff, Adam, and obviously I saw your post about Tonic Rider. Is that mental health support for musicians? It is, yeah. I, I often get asked to do groups and stuff and sometimes it doesn't feel right for me, but regarding Tonic, I've always liked what they do because they they offer mental health support, but they also use music. So they it's kind of like pseudo music therapy and they're a very small little community-based thing in Portsmouth. But I think, you know, Terry Hall's involved, Barry Esquire from Bears. They're all really involved, really organic. So they do these charity events. Um, and it's just caring the community in that sense. It's trying to help people to use music, songwriting courses. And they've just launched a bigger initiative to do online peer support groups during COVID for musicians and people in the music industry. So when they contacted me, I said, yeah, you know, I think it's such a shit time that I'd be happy to give something back. Um, so that's how I got involved with them. So I'm just going to be running a weekly, uh, like hour, hour and a half peer support group, really, with a bit of psych education for people to get them through in these these current times. Because to be honest, I think there's not enough musicians or ex-musicians or wherever coming forward. You know, there's an awful massive gap between your big players that don't need to tour every other year and people that are really doing it because they need to pay their rent from doing, you know, a two-week tour every two months. So for me, it's just like I just... It's really important for anyone that's got any weight in the industry to give something back and not stand back and leave it to other people, really. Tommy, you mentioned you could have uh, done with some more guidance back in the day. Is that something that you would have appreciated at the time? Yeah, and going back to, like, being young and it all being a bit of a whirlwind, like, I think management early on would have... We kind of went through a different management and... I guess we never got fully comfortable with, with someone or whatever. But yeah, we we could have definitely done with um, some guidance, definitely on the fact that we we toured more than we should have been in the studio, like you you mentioned earlier, Adam. Are you a psychotherapist by day now, Adam? Is that right? Both, really. You know, I'm really lucky enough to see maybe two or three um, one-to-one clients every day. I'm, st- I'm just finishing my doctorate off, um, so that's all coming together. And I also you know do music every day so I'm really lucky in that sense I'll either be playing music just to be able to play or going towards a pretty release another EP and it's nice because I can tour when I want to tour I can release when I want to release it'll be peer funded um I feel really privileged to be honest uh, in that situation peer funded how does how does that work sorry um I guess that means that people are going to fund it who want to buy it Maybe that's the wrong one. Uh, right, okay. Crowd, crowdfunded, not peer funded. Peer, peer support group I'm doing, and this is crowdfunded. You know, pledge music type stuff, although that's folded now. There's other avenues to get um, patrons and stuff. Crowdfunding, I think I've got a nice, firm, secure fan base that uh, enable me to do small tours and to self release still. Um, so I'm, I'm really lucky, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't have to do it, which is really nice. When did you get into the psychotherapy kind of side of it? Um, six years ago, I started training. Um, I got into it through my own experience on the other side of the chair, really struggling and realizing that there's not many people that understand A, being a musician, B, being a musician in the music industry, and C, being a musician in the music industry with a lot of media hype and all the fame that's involved with that. Um, and, you know, and adding to that substance struggles, I think there's very few therapist to understand those different lenses so I thought well that'd be really interesting and I really enjoy working with musicians um, in that sense and really there's there's something that you can't read about in books um, so that's how I got into it really is that quite a rewarding job obviously it's great yeah especially when you know and I can talk from experience I'm not just saying to people you know don't do this and do that it's like well you can do this but from my experience and some of the people I work with, this this may be the outcome of whatever you choose to do. Yeah, just finish on the Tonic Rider stuff. Uh, like, where can people find that? Is it all on all online? Yeah, if you just go to tonicmusic.co.uk, uh, or there's loads of stuff online, just Google Tonic Music. Like I say, it's, it's a local initiative, but during these COVID times, they're really pushing it out to support as many musicians and people in the industry as possible. Um, I think in times like this, even just checking in weekly with other people in the same boat, it's so valuable. You know, having a chance to really express how you feel. Um, it's, there's so many people are now isolated. 
And I think out of everybody that suffered through this whole pandemic, no one more than musicians. Um, you know, everything's been taken away from sense of identity to income, all these different things that people have ploughed their life into. Um, and the government don't seem to be doing anything about it. I guess the not knowing when things are back to normal must be even worse kind of thing. Yeah, it's horrendous. It really is. You know, it's people's livelihoods. And we, all of us, I don't think there's a person in this world that isn't moved by music. Um, and it can be a very sterile environment. And I think something like this could really kill some of the more organic, grittier musical creatives. And, you know, for those of musicians that are safe, that's fine. But I think the up and coming people that are really, um, I don't know, just, just, just really infused and don't have that big backing, they're the ones that are going to be wiped out from this. Mm-hmm.